metaphor, as he constructs his discourse of conquest and conquer in the land of the rising sun and builds his narration up into a sexy tension that can only be relieved by his successful mounting of the fairy peak, the beguiling queen of mountains, the siren, upon which the gazes of both the Japanese and foreign foreigners converge in agreement that Fujisan, also known as Mount Fuji, is not merely the most beautiful natural object of this island empire, but of this earth. Halliburton is thus tempted by this mountain, saying that in the early morning, I happened to glance south, and there rose the haunting siren, pale, proud, majestic. I turned my head away, raised the shade to shut the curtain view, all in vain. She taunted me even through the curtain. Halliburton is able to resist this taunting, or this state of wonder, only for so long before he is compelled to pull out his ice pick and climb to the snowy peak of the volcano, becoming the first man to ever conquer the blizzard-ravaged Mao of Mount Fuji during the snowy season. Halliburton's narrative ends here with a brief explication of the welcoming reception that he receives and that his story receives upon his return to the United States. And he shares his, uh, when he shares his heroic tale of the defeat of the Japanese landscape, of this incomparable mountain that is the symbol of Japan itself. It almost goes without saying that Halliburton's books and fame as a traveler reached their peak with the American public shortly before and during the years of World War II. Um, in the text, in the final text that I want to add to this, Palacio, Sergio Gutierrez Negron, like Halliburton, directly engages with Columbus's discourse. Gutierrez Negron establishes a discursive network of crisscross conversations, of relationships, emails, dreams, songs, and longings, as one of the protagonists of this polyvocal narration search, searches for his missing wife, who silently left him one morning and their home and fled to Japan uh, when they were first located in Atlanta. To the delayed and fragmentary mediations of emails and Skype messages, the reader and the narrator, narrator come to understand that this missing wife has been hired to read the diaries of the recently deceased daughter, Katie, of an aging Japanese man. The diaries, written in English, are read aloud by Alice, the wife, who sits alone in the traditional Japanese stone garden at the house of this Japanese man. Alice's voice and the writings of Katie, in turn, are recorded by hundreds of talking parrots that are able to mimic her voice and repeat so many words. This displacement of Katie's voice into the voice of Alice is an act of translation that mimics, uh, and I'm quoting Margarita Samora, um, the decisive mediation of Bartolome de las Casas, who copied, edited, paraphrased, and commented on a significant number of Columbus's writings, some of which survive only in las Casas' versions Conversely, the Colombian texts that remain lost today, including the diarios of the second, third, and fourth navigations, are in part unavailable because Las Casas did not transcribe them. Thus, much of our understanding of the discovery, much of what we know of what Columbus got or said, as well as what we do not, is the result of Las Casas' intervention in the transmission of the Colombian texts. Um, so knowing this, um, knowing having this intervention of Las Casas in mind, and this idea of what 
is and is not revealed about the life of Katie as mediated by Alice and also by the meddling hand of Katie's father, this Japanese professor, uh, who one day, as Alice is nearing the final stages of this project of recording, uh, breaks into the space of the garden and upon hearing the voice of all of these birds, which are mimicking the voices of both Katie and Alice, is driven to destroy not only the diaries, but to also free the birds, uh, which burst out in a blackening cloud of parrots against the sky. This image of the birds against the sky again evokes an image found in Columbus's text, and I quote, and the singing of the small birds, it is so marvelous that it seems that a man would never want to leave this place. And there are flocks of parrots that obscure the sun, and birds of so many kinds and sizes, and so different from ours, that it is a marvel. That's Columbus. Diary. With this image, Gutierrez Negron, um, and the narration in Palacio take up the same elements found in the metaphorical space of this garden. But instead of trying to stay in this place, Gutierrez creates an image that undoes this place with a gesture that releases the birds that used to make up this paradise, and which may perhaps also be a gesture, no, that is also a gesture that unravels the narrative embodied within the elements of the garden. To conclude, I want to ask if the narrative of Palacio offers the possibility um, of the creation of an imaginary where there can be a contemplation or an understanding that is not grasping, not an insertion of an ice pick into the slippery walls of Mount Fuji, nor the thrusting of a sword into the but instead, an endless undoing, an endless process of letting go, of releasing, that occurs not only at the ends of things, but because of its engagement uh, with the discourse of Columbus, also at the beginnings. Uh, or is this just another projection, a contemporary imaging? of the same wonder, merely placed within the structure, the networks, the flight lines of um, contemporary Uh, hello, I'm Juan Antonio Del Monte. I'm from Tijuana. I'm doing uh, an MA in Cultural Studies back in TJ with a, with a thesis um, about bikers and lowrider uh, cultures. So this is part uh, of that thesis. I, I, I will point um, some of my uh, theoretical framework and um, some a preliminary um, <clears throat> preliminary findings. Uh, excuse my English is not that good, but uh, I will do my best. Maybe I will read some parts of this. Um, okay. Uh, I will talk to you about the creation and reinforcement of identities through modern machines, which are characterized by territorial mobility. Um, the select uh, unit of analysis uh, for these investigations are biker and lowrider clubs in the city of Tijuana, especially two clubs, uh, Solo Angeles, only angels in, for, for English, and Duques, Dukes. Uh, my hypothesis is that the identity of bikers and lowriders is enhanced upon circulation on the streets. So, 
Bikers and Lowrider in Tijuana. The collectives of bikers and lowriders are two distinct cultural phenomena that in the northern Mexican border are crea created around motor vehicles. In the city of Tijuana, located in the south side of the border next to San Diego, California, multiple squads of bikers roam the streets every day. United, united by their huge cruiser motorcycles, wearing bandanas on their heads and the patches of the club on their leather jackets, known uh, the famous co colores or colors. The streets are also cruised by slow, uh, slowly by tumbados, low rider cars, modified to be closer uh, to the floor, proudly showing on the rear window the club plate. Some of them even have hydraulic pumps on their axles so they can jump with cadence while pump pomposely roaming the streets. Um, okay. The, the appearance of groups around motor vehicles has been uh, associated with the emergency of juvenile cultures in the 60s. Uh, the young, uh, back, back in the 60s, started to be seen not as a transition between childhood and adulthood, but, but as having their own action capacities. They begin to be seen uh, at the first, uh, st and stigmatized as a social problem. The culture industry, such as movies, literal, literature, as well as the press, offered the presentation of problem youngsters that had values different from their parents. There are uh, a lot of movies about bikers and, 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 and lowriders, like The Wild One, uh, uh, Marlon Brando acting there, Easy Rider of Peter Fonda, uh, he Hell's Angels is a famous book uh, right by Hunter Thompson, uh, this one uh, right also a uh, fear and loathing in Las Vegas. And for, for low riders, there are uh, the famous suits riot riots in LA. So two particularities of the emergence of juvenile cultures are relevant here, being popular and being iconoclastic. Popu popular, popul populist because the likes of the popular and lower urban classes were accepted more and more as a way of taking distance from the rules and values of their parents' generation. The iconoclast character is owed special to the expressivity of their demonstrations, a way of bursting in the public space that did not agree with the behavior patterns of the elder generations. So, low riders in Tijuana, there are a transborder phenomenon. The consolidation of this phenomena in the city of Tijuana has received a great historical influx by similar practices generated on the northern side of the border. But I'd like to, warn, to make a warning here. These practices in Tijuana do not respond to the simple fact of being a border and repeating, like a mirror, cultural manifestation on the other side of the line. It is to say that influence received from practices on the American side is not of a homo homogenizing nature, because in the becoming of, of, the group, of the group's confirmation, a differentiated influence and in social and cultural interaction is implied, which carries implicit dynamics of resistant, resistance, domination, appropriation, and meanings. So, I understand bikers and lowriders uh, as two cultural phenomena that are distinguishable as an identity and meeting point around a car and a motorcycle that can be cruised about uh, the city of Tijuana. The analysis is framed in the identities and automobility theories that I will uh, make some points, uh, show some points here. So, some ideas uh, for the uh, identities approach. Um, identities can only be formed from the belonging cultures. I think here about uh, bikers and lowrider cultures. Um, identities are not an, es an essence. Uh, they are not a, an intrinsic attribute of persons. They are genera generated in the significant social interactions. So, um, biker and low riders identity are uh, socially created. Identities are historical and situational processes. Uh, there are process. Mm, they are not finished process. Bikers and low riders have a specific historic development, uh, like uh, uh, the. The movies and the press are very important for, for this uh, part, but they are also placed in, in a here and a now that gives them form. Uh, that is the Tijuana, in my case, 
of the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, recognition is a central operation in the construction of identity. Um, in order for the biker and lowrider's identities can be achieved and took place in Tijuana society, recognition has to exist from others that interact with it and that also attribute, me attribute meanings. This is a negotiation between a self-membership and exo-membership or exo-identity. Uh, in self-membership, uh, individual personality is included in a collective uh, in a collectivity, this is uh, my, my personality is included in bikers and lowriders cultures. And exo membership uh, char is character characterized um, in in bikers and lowriders in Tijuana as a stigma or a stereotype uh, or prejudice. So um, collective identities. Uh, this is like a difficult. Uh, theoretical problem, but uh, I, I take it like a common perception of a relative homogeneous we-ness, like uh, nosotros, call it in Spanish. In, in, in this uh, biker and lowrider's identities, I, I, I found like a carnalismo, you know, like a brotherhoodism, I don't know how it's in English. Um, and last but not least, identities imply a dis dispute. In the deployment of social interactivity, identities are not flat flat, they involve constant struggle from positions of power. From the use of public space to cruise, to the logo they will use to be recognized, biker and lowrider identities are const constantly disputing a place in the community. So here comes the, the other uh, concept that I, I, I'm developing, uh, the automobilities. Uh, here's a dimension of a mobility parad paradigm, paradigm, I don't know how to say it. Um, so the essential character of motor, motorized identity of bikers and lowriders is that the sense of belonging is constructed by means of artifacts that are defined by the possibility of movement, movement motorcycle and cars. Um, automobility, according to Scheller and Uri, is a complex amalgam of interlocking machines, social practices, and ways of dwelling. Not in a stationary home, but in a mobile, semi-privatized, and hugely dangerous capsule. I will stand in this investigation the concept to bikes, leaving out the idea of being a capsule, which places the, boy, the, the trip in motorcycle in a completely different situation as, as that in a car. Um, okay, the identities. With this, I want to say that identities are mobilizing in the city. So uh, this. Perform performing the identity on the street is like a central character in my, in, in my investigation. So, okay. Lowrider cars. These are uh, a photo, uh, photos that I took on, on my field work. I have to say that I made like a couple of months of participant observation with uh, these two clubs. Um, I made uh, 11 in-depth uh, interviews, so uh, this is to frame my uh, the methodolo methodological approach to, of my investigation. Low riders, I have to say that it's a phenomenon that in its origin is noticeable ethnic. Uh, it is associated with the vindications of the Chicano people in the United States. It, it is also has been seen as a way of uh, resistance to the American uh, autom automobile culture, especially the hot rods, these al altered cars made to run with power. Uh, the literature said that while the hat rod expressed I'm fast and I'm mean, the low rider uh, expressed I'm slow and I'm cool. So uh, <laughs> one emphasized power and speed, the other emphasized the show, no? the expressive uh, of his identity. So um, there is also a continuum uh, uh, in the symbolic expression of the pachucos, the cholos, and the low riders. Uh, there's a lot of literature that, that say this. Um, uh, the Pachuco uh, are characterized uh, uh, for these bicultural references expressed, especially with the language twist for Spanish and English, the tattoos and, and, and the famous suit suit, with ample stacks to dance the boogie and swing, uh, clearly showing a posture, posture in front of the fashion establishment. The Cholos are youngsters that had been seen st stigmatized as dysfunctional in respect to the dominant uh, social system, delinquent, background, promiscuous, illiterate, drug addicts. 
uh, are like stigmas or stereotypes of uh, cholos. So, a lowrider car, according to uh, Brenda Bright, uh, this um, uh, scholar that has dedicated uh, a lot of time of in lowriders, said that a lowrider is a baroque ride considered to be a Chicano aesthetic. Uh, it's a uh, low ride, low, uh, Chicano low, lowers the cars. Uh, to within a few inches of the ground, makes it beautiful inside and out, and drives very, very slowly. Its main feature is a hydraulic lift system which can rise and lower the car by installing car batteries and hydraulic pumps in, in the trunks that are connected to lift cylinders, cylinders at each wheels. For many at this point in the process, the car comes alive. It is now a low rider. This process of uh, the pumps started back in the 60s as a way of resistance of, um, to, to police. Uh, th there, there was this law in California that, that cars can't be, I mean, inches to the ground. So they developed this system to, when a police car is coming, they <laughs> uh, switch up. So um, Lowriders in Tijuana, this is the group Duques, uh, where I um, make my field work, one of them. Um, the Duques Club, uh, from uh, it, it has his roots in Tijuana. The lowrider uh, phenomenon in California has its roots in Tijuana. It's interesting. I will read uh, like a short. The Duque, Duques Club from Los Angeles is recognized as the oldest lowrider club still in existence. The, Re the Ruelas brothers, founders of the club in LA, are from Tijuana. They began as a social club in Tijuana with the name of Duque, Duques and turned it into a car club in Los Angeles. They rise as, 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 as an association alternative to the high society clubs, the Rotary and Lions and Kiwanis and all these. The Dukes Club that exists in Tijuana, these ones, disassociate themselves currently and historically from the evolvement of the Los Angeles Dukes. So this is like a contradiction that I found in the fieldwork. Uh, even though the club, the club arose in Tijuana when the Relas brothers left to, to LA, the Duques unfolded into two clubs that aside from having the same name and almost identical logo, is like uh, this uh, um, hat uh, and similar practice around the cars, the low riding cars, uh, they not recognized as chapters of one of them. So the other club that I made my field work uh, was um, a biker club. So speaking of, of the bikers, uh, has arrived, the biker has arrived to our days through strongly stereotyped imagery of vandalist, vandalistic, delinquent, and libertine and corrupt conducts. To speak of bikers is not only to talk about how the phenomenon of associating and cruising streets and roads was conformed, but it is also to mention how those social representations, especially in the movies, uh, have linked them to a negative image. Uh, has most effectively been spread in greater social sector, sectors, even having influence with the idea bikers have of themselves. So there's a, like a founding myth in uh, biker cultures, the Hollister uh, inc um, incident, they say, uh, is considered a foundational myth in the biker culture. It is an exag ex 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 exaggeration of the press about what happened in that town in Hollister, California. Uh, witnesses says that it was only a wild party, but uh, the press uh, says it was a pandemonium in Hollister. Um, there is a very famous picture, this one, shown in Life magazine of a drunk youngster mounted on a bike, pretty inoffensive because of his drunkness. <laughs> a totally uh, different biker was characterized by Marlon Brando, that one, in the movie The Wild One, which has been perhaps one of the most important factors uh, for the spreading of the concept of the outlaw biker based on the Hollister incidents. Um, the most famous club that rises under the stigma of, uh, danger, of danger is the Hells Angel Club. Uh, Hunter Thompson, that uh, I say about him, makes an excellent report about them. I will read a little part of the, uh, this book. The only basic difference between the Hells Angels and other outlaw clubs are that the angels are in extreme situation. Most, most of the remaining are part-time outlaws, but the angels interpret 
interpret their roles seven days a week. They show their patches at home, in the street, and sometimes even at work. They take the, their bikes to buy a quart of milk at the corner store. The angel feels naked and invalid without its colors, like a knight without armor. The last image, uh, a knight without armor, is part of the legacy left by the American and Outlaw clubs to the clubs we can find in Tijuana, as the field work experience has shown with the Solo Angeles. These are the bikers that are uh, Solo Angeles, the only angels uh, that I uh, made my field work with them. Uh, they are the strongest biker club in Tijuana the only angels. They are named that way in order to disassociate themselves from the hell's angels. They, they, they say me this. They, they, we're not uh, hell's angels, we're not bad, you know. Although they have the irreverent and fearful attitude of the biker. No. Especially him. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, like a, a story, the first time that I, uh, that I um, came with the bikers, they, they they said to me, go, go out, man. We don't want to talk with you. Uh, they were drunk, right? I, I didn't notice. So the second time I came closer to them at the day with my ID, this is, I'm Juan, and I will make an investigation of you. Oh, come on. And, and it was this guy. Like, it's like a two faces guy. <laughs> so, um, Although they have the irreverent and fearful attitude of the biker, this club is special in showing a philanthropist face in Tijuana society. 